Sorry about that. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> so glad that you're all here today. Please join me in prayer as we prepare our hearts to enter into a time of worship this morning. Father, we come before you today seeking to know you and to depend on you with all of our hearts. Help us to give you all of our praise and to welcome you here into our hearts, into this place this morning. Help us to give you all of our song, all of ourselves, that we can hold back nothing as we praise you with all of our hearts. You are so good, Father, to us. Help us to devo devote this time to you and to worship you. We love you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
take a moment to give the Lord control to open our hearts and to help us remember His word and His promises. Aside from our sin and brokenness, we have nothing to offer. So let's open our hearts to allow Him to move in us. Let's take this time to pray.
so good. May we sing of your goodness for the rest of our lives. Help us to live for your glory forevermore. Help us to receive your word and burn it on our hearts today, Father, as Pastor Frank preaches this morning. Fill him with your spirit and guide him according to your will to speak with authority and power. Convict him of your message and use him to encourage and strengthen your people here today. We thank you for this time, Father, and we ask that you help us to know your word and to receive your message with open hearts. We love you when we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we receive the message, the children and youth have a special announcement. Thank you, baby.
Oh. It's cute. It's a, it's a shirt with a tie. It's cute. Thank you. Thank you uh, to our children and to our youth for honoring the dads today. And we always joke around that dads usually get the short end of the stick because Mother Day, Mother's Day comes first. Um, but thank you so much for honoring the dads um, as we come to worship uh, today. So, you know, as we've been studying the book of Nehemiah, uh, I think one of the things we have to remember, and I don't know if you guys see this or not, as we've been studying the book of Nehemiah, but as we've been studying the book of Nehemiah, I hope you see new community in the story, okay? Because that's what, actually what we've been trying to do and trying to teach. And as we come to today's text, Nehemiah chapter 8, uh, we were talking as staff, we are like, I think this is exactly where we are at as a church. We're like right here in this part of the story in terms of what God has been doing in our church and where we are right now. And so we are excited for what God has already done, what he's doing now, what he's going to do tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow holds. But as we come, we realize, oh, one of the things that we have done as a church is we've rebuilt the walls and we've committed ourselves back to the word. And as a result, we're able to actually reestablish ourselves in worship. And so that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today as we study Nehemiah chapter 8. Why don't you pray with me as we get started. God, we thank you that you are the good, good father. And um, perhaps even as we come to worship today, as we honor our fathers and we think about our fathers and we, we think about maybe they weren't the great da- greatest dads, you know, yet at the same time, we thank you so much that in heaven, you, God, are a good, good father who is good to us, good to his people, good to his children. And I thank you so much for the opportunity that you give us to look into your word today. And we pray that as we go into your room, we would find your goodness there. We would find your love there. We would find your grace there. We would find your forgiveness there. And know that, God, no matter where we are in life, we can come to your word. We can come to your truth, God, and reconnect with you once again. That's what we want to do, Lord, as we look at Nehemiah chapter 8 today. So, Lord, may your word speak to us, and may we receive it with gladness. May we receive it with joy, with anticipation, and with excitement today. We thank you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. David Peterson in his book, Engaging with God, a biblical theology of worship, once said this. He says, throughout the Bible, acceptable worship means approaching or engaging with God on the terms he proposes and in the manner that he makes possible. It involves honoring, serving, and respecting him, abandoning any loyalty or devotion that hinders an exclusive relationship with him. And although some of Scripture's terms for worship may refer to specific gestures of homage, rituals of priestly ministrations, worship is more fundamentally faith expressing itself in obedience and adoration. And I really feel like this comment from David uh, Peterson really encapsulates the life of Nehemiah as we've been studying. We've learned that Nehemiah is one who waits in prayer, right? He's approached. He engages with God on God's terms. Right, as Nehemiah is able to stand against the external and the internal opposition to complete the wall, what did he do? He honored, he served, right? He was exclusively loyal to God, right? And then in utilizing the promise found in the word of God, Nehemiah boldly expresses his faith, right, and his obedience, right? That's why he prayed in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 8. It says, God, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, God promises, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. See, and because Nehemiah is exclusively devoted to God, he rebuilds the walls, right? And he's able to gather God's people back into the city of Jerusalem, right? Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days, right? What couldn't be done in 140 years, the wall is built in 52 days. And you would think that the story would actually end there. But it actually doesn't end there. In chapter 7, the rebuilding continues. Nehemiah reestablishes leadership 
to the city, right? He appoints gatekeepers, guards, commanders, priests, musicians. And then he actually reestablishes membership in the, in the church, in the community, registering the people, repopulating the empty city. Why? Ultimately, to reestablish worship, which actually brings us to today's text. So it's Nehemiah, all of chapter 8. Actually, start in verse 73. When the seventh month came, And the Israelites had settled in their towns. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. And he read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for this occasion. And beside him on his right stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah. And on his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malkajah, Hashem, Heshbadanah, Zechariah, and Meshalem. There's more names. No, we're not there yet. Verse 5. And so Ezra opened the book, right? He unraveled the scroll, and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. What did Ezra do? Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And what did the people do? They lifted their hands and responded, amen, amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then the Levites, Yeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been mourning or had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some of those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people. Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. And on the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the teacher to give attention to the word of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees, and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make temporary shelters, as it is written. And so the people went out, brought back branches, and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company, all of the people that had returned from exile, built temporary shelters and lived in them. And from the days of Joshua, long time ago, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this. And their joy was very great. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God, and they celebrated the festival for seven days. And on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. It's the word of the Lord. So yes, the city has been rebuilt. The city has been reestablished. But now it's actually time now to reestablish worship, right? Now Ezra and Nehemiah put the word of God at the center of this church, at the center of this community. And so this morning, we want to answer three questions that will help us reestablish worship as we build for God. 
Three questions that will help us reestablish worship as we build for God. And the first question we'll answer is this. What enables us to reestablish worship? And I think there's three things. It's actually proclamation of the word, conviction of the word, and a response to the word. Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, the primary task of the church and of the Christian minister is the preaching of the word of God. The decadent periods, right, times of moral and spiritual decline in the history of the church have always been those periods when preaching had declined. Why? Because God, through the power and conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit, uses the word of God to cleanse us, to revive us. And we can argue, actually, that's the time we are living in today here in America. We're asking, where is the preaching and the teaching of God's word? And so we're asking, what enables the godly builder? What enables us to reestablish worship? First thing is this, the proclamation of the word, right? Because in order to reestablish worship, we have to actually study the word. We actually have to teach it. We actually have to proclaim it. Look at verse 73. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out, what, the book of the law, of Moses, right? The Pentateuch, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which the Lord had given and commanded for Israel. Right? The seventh month was a special time in the Jewish calendar where they celebrate the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And we have to remember, since the walls were destroyed, the people could not worship. And since now they have fortified the city, they can refocus now. They can worship now. And this is the perfect time for Israel to get back into the word. Look at verse 2. So on the first day of the seventh month, right, it's kind of like New Year's Day, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. And he read it aloud from daybreak till noon. So it's probably like five or six hours as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people... They listened attentively to the book of the law. Look at verse 4. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform, kind of like this, right, on a pulpit built for the occasion, verse 5. And so Ezra unravels the scroll, opens the book, and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he unraveled it, the people, what did they do? They stood up. Now, you don't have to stand up. Okay, we're preaching. It's okay. But look at what happens. The first thing Ezra does, he offers worship. Look at verse 6. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, amen, amen. And they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. See, the people honored the word by standing up with anticipation. They're preparing themselves to hear from the word of God. They're not preparing, actually, to hear from Ezra, but they're preparing to hear from God himself. That's why Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, which you have heard from us, you accepted it not, what, as human word, but as it actually is. It's the word of God. It's the word of God itself, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Ezra is proclaiming the actual, spoken words of God. So it's not like, preacher, show me what you got. Make me laugh. Impress me. No, God, as we come, you have to say, God, what is it that you have for me? What do you want to teach me? Rebuke me. Where do you want to correct me and raise me up and train me in the ways of righteousness? And so, yeah, Ezra taught for like five, six hours. And the people stood there the entire time. And this went on for a week. So please, no complaining when the message is 45 minutes long, 60 minutes long. And the reason why sometimes we do go long is because we have to proclaim it. We have to explain it. So we can properly understand what God is telling us, what God is saying. So even for Ezra in helping the people to understand, look at what the Levites do. Look at verse 7. The Levites instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there, right? These 13 men, Joshua, Bani, all of them, read from the word 
uh, read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving it meaning so that the people understood what was being read, right, what was being proclaimed, right? Because many of these people, they lived as exiles in Babylon, and they probably had not have worshipped as a community for probably 140 years since the walls were broken down. Some have never heard the word of God proclaimed. And many of them lost their ability to actually understand the original language, to understand Hebrew. So these Levites, whenever there's a break in the reading, just like we do in Bible study together, Levites answered questions, interpreted, and explained. He just told them, this is what the word of God says, right? To bring clarity and to bring meaning to what is being said. And you notice that Ezra, again, verse 18, proclaimed without ceasing. He just kept going and going and going, verse 18, day after day, from the first day to the last. Ezra read from the book of the law of God, and they celebrated the festival for seven days. And on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. See, without ceasing, from sunrise to noon, for one week, without complaining, in reverence, in fear of God, they physically stood, proclaimed, and studied the word of God. As Psalm 119, 120 reminds us, my flesh, it commands us, my flesh trembles in fear of you. I stand in awe of your laws. Right? So I don't understand why we're always in a rush. Why worship sometimes takes a back burner to our schedules. Like we're too, um, too much in a rush to, for, for service to end, for the message to end. Because guys, shorter is not always better. Right? Message is better shorter if it's bad. That's the only time. But we intentionally do this. We, we say what, why, and how. We answer those questions because we want to understand what God is trying to teach us. And so we're asking the question, what enables us to reestablish worship? First thing is proclamation of the word. And the second thing is this. It's conviction of the word. Right? Because any biblical conviction that we receive cannot come until you proclaim the word. And until you study it. And when you teach the word with anticipation and it's explained, it leads to a conviction. And in this case, it was a conviction of sin. Look at verse 9. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. See, as Ezra reads the word, as the Levites explain the word, the immediate response is grief and mourning over sin. And you're like, why did the people weep? Well, they realized they neglected the word. And while the law itself cannot save us, it can certainly speak to us and convict us and convince us that we do need to repent. And so the Jews observe the Day of Atonement. And while they do not need to grieve and mourn, Nehemiah, Ezra, well, they do need to grieve and mourn, Nehemiah, Ezra, and the Levites, they also tell the people, celebrate, rejoice for the forgiveness that you have found, right? Verse 10, Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites calmed all the people, saying, be still for this is a holy day. Do not grieve right three times the jews are told do not grieve and yes while they did wrestle with their sin they have to remember sin has actually also been conquered the word has been given the instruction has been given to overcome that sin for when you've been forgiven you don't have a reason now to grieve now i've been around christians who are like these debbie downers kind of these negative nancies that only see doom and gloom in their lives. Everything is so hard. World stands against me, right? Nothing's going to get better. And it's actually an ungodly response. Because it doesn't honor God and what God has already done. He's already died for our sin. He's already rescued us. He's given us his words so that we would know how to obey. So verse 12 goes on and says, And all the people went away to eat and drink to send portions of food, and to do what? And to celebrate. Celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words. They were convicted that had been made known to them. So yes, word of God brings conviction. It leads us to repentance. But it also brings great joy for the healing we've found 
even in our disobedience. So there are times to grieve. There are times to celebrate. You actually need both. And that's why a lot of times during worship service, closing praise, even the time of fellowship, is very powerful after the word has been preached. But when we proclaim the word, when we're convicted by it, we realize, oh, God is the one that is speaking. We know if the message is bad, we're like doing everything to get out of here. But no, when God is speaking, when we proclaim it, when we're convicted by it and God is speaking, we know God's moving and we don't want to leave. And so we're asking what enables us to reestablish worship. First thing is proclamation of the word. Second is conviction of the word. And third thing is this. We have to respond to the word. Okay, respond to the word. The Bible is not meant to just be heard and studied, but to cut to the heart and to be obeyed. Yes, the walls were built. Yes, the enemies know that Jerusalem is now the city of God, yet the work was not done. Nehemiah, Ezra, the Levites, and the people rediscovered the instructions that they found in the book of Leviticus, right? Look at verse 14. They found written in the law, this is Leviticus 23, which the Lord had commanded through Moses that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month, right? During the Feast of Tabernacles, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make temporary shelters as it is written. Right? Obedience to the written word. And you see by their example that it's not enough just to proclaim it, just to be convicted by it. You actually have to respond to it just as it is written. For the Feast of Tabernacles... Right, to remember their wandering in the wilderness, God's deliverance from Egypt, the people would actually physically go out, gather branches and leaves to create these temporary shelters framed with wood and canvas, and the roofs were made with these branches and leaves. And so what happens in verse 16? So, in response, right, in response to the word, the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate, and the one by the gate of Ephraim. Right? During these seven days of the feast, the Jews typically actually lived inside of these temporary shelters, these booths, on the roof of their homes. But for this particular celebration, this time of rededication and renewal, they built these shelters everywhere, on their roofs, in the courtyards, in the temple court, by the water gate, and by the gate of Ephraim. I mean, even if you wanted to, you could not get away from it. There wasn't enough space because everywhere you turned, there would have been a visible reminder of what God had done, right? Not just in Egypt from that deliverance, but now in the reestablished city of God, the walls have been built. The city has been repopulated, and there's like revival as they're responding to the word. Verse 17 the whole company, everyone, not one person skipped out, that had returned from the exile, built temporary shelters, and lived in them. And from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this. And their joy was very great. Right? It had been a while since the, since the Israelites responded in obedience and in celebration, at least 140 years, to God's word in this way. And since the days of Joshua until now, the Jews did not go out of their way to make shelters and to live in them. Because either you're going to respond to the word or you're not. Right? There's no middle. Either you're going to obey God or you're not. Yet as we look at the story, they make it known to God. They make it known to one another. We will obey. We will obey the word once again. And not only do they celebrate the deliverance, they're excited about how God's going to continue to deliver them as they look ahead. And so we're asking the question, what enables us to reestablish worship? First is proclamation of the word. Second, conviction of the word. Third is response to the word. Right? So the focus is the word of God. Okay? Which leads us to the second question. Why does the word of God help us reestablish worship? And actually, I only have one point. But just because I have one point doesn't mean that it's going to be shorter, okay? One point. Because the word of God is the foundation to revival. The word of God is the foundation to revival. 
The Word of God allows us to experience the power and the blessings of God in our lives. You know, I think about all the retreats, all the revival meetings, all the praise nights that I've gone to in my life. And I would go to all of these meetings. And I would leave, like, like amped up, fired up. But after a few days, a few weeks, a few months, I'd be spiritually dead, hoping to capture, right, that moment once again. Maybe you're better than me. But, you know, I would go to these retreats and conferences and stuff. And I'm like, I want to hear a good praise team. I want to hear a great drummer. I want to hear a great speaker. I want to find new skit ideas. And I want to see my old friends. And I wouldn't even look forward to the time of the word. I wouldn't look forward to the time of prayer. Because all I wanted was everything else but God and his word. And then I, now I know why I was dead and why it was so hard. Because whatever happens here in Jerusalem, it's a direct result of God's people wanting to find God once again through the word. Because without the word, there's no power. Without the word, there's no blessing. Without the word, we don't know how to follow and how to obey God. And while revival is ultimately, yes, it is God's work, somehow mysteriously through the Holy Spirit, it's through the word that we find renewal and reformation. Right? There's no other way for revival to happen. It begins when the word is at the center of our worship. Look at verse 1. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. Right? The people were eager to hear, and Ezra was eager to teach. Verse 3. Ezra read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who would understand, who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. All the men, all the women, all the children, all the rich, all the poor, all those who had ears, they heard. And they listened in anticipation and in reverent expectation, right? Verse 5, so Ezra opened the book. And all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. And this may have been one of the reasons why they didn't set up in front of the temple or at the temple. Because maybe the acoustics at the water gate were better. So that it could be accessible to everyone. Not just the priests. Because the word has authority. And I think Ezra spoke unapologetically with force and with conviction. And this is actually Ezra's moment. This is Ezra's moment, because we have to remember that even before Nehemiah comes to Jerusalem to start rebuilding the walls, Ezra probably had been there around 14 years. And even though he could not complete the wall, Ezra 7 tells us he had the gracious hand of God actually was upon him. And so Ezra was already seeking to bring God's people back to the ways of the Lord, right? Ezra 7.10 says this, For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord, and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel, right? And this was his time. This was his moment. He had devoted himself to the word of God, and now he's going to be used to start revival. The unleashing of God's power, the unleashing of God's blessing. Then in verse 6, Ezra, what did he do? He praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen. Amen. And they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So, I mean, if God is speaking to you during praise, I think you should respond. When you're singing a song that says, I will lift my hands, I think you should lift your hands. If God is speaking to you during the message, you can say amen, you can smile, you can nod your head, you can look at me. I know, you know, you don't want to necessarily look at me, but you can. You can respond to God's word. And you realize, like, even when God's humbling you, when, you know, you don't obviously do it here, but you get on your knees if God's speaking to you, God's humbling you. You put your face to the ground. I think it's actually very literal. It's very literal. It's very physical. Because the people lifted their hands, and they respond with a great roar, right? Amen. Amen. It invol- I think it involves your entire being. So as we study the word, as we receive conviction of our sin, and we say, Lord, I want to obey, like the Israelites, we can't hold back. We have to give all of ourselves to it. 
Right? Why is the word of God the foundation of revival? Because revival begins in repentance. Right? Because revival, yes, ultimately is the work of God. Through the power of his spirit, not a preacher. But God uses his word by the spirit through the preacher to somehow quicken our spirits to obey. Somehow he used Ezra to do that. Right? Verse 9, then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. Nehemiah in verse 10 said, this day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people saying, be still for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. And they repeatedly tell the Jews that this is a holy day. This is a holy day. It's the Feast of Trumpets. It, Feast of Trumpets was an outward expression of anticipation. Anticipating on the Lord to deliver and to rescue. Waiting for the release of God's power and God's blessing upon their church, upon their community. And just as the Lord had shown himself to Moses at Sinai, the people anticipated and said, Lord, show yourself, show your power once again. And so in verse 12, all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy. Because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. And so just as the Israelites celebrate in anticipation of what God is going to do next in their community, we celebrate in anticipation what God is going to do next for our church, for new community. Because like I said at, at the outset, all that we've studied in the book of Nehemiah so far, right? All the waiting, the planning, the building, the opposition, and now establishing worship, building on the foundation of God's word, all of it, I find it actually parallels with our church. Our walls were destroyed. We want to be the relevant, cool, secret, sensitive church. We are nor, you know, we're neither relevant, we are neither cool, we are neither secret, sensitive. And when we did that, we strayed away from the word. And in doing so, we strayed away from repentance. And in doing so, we did not focus on discipleship and on spiritual maturity. And I don't know if you guys see it. I see it. We are experiencing a revival before our very eyes. Rediscovering the power of God as we recommit ourselves to prayer and to God's word. Rediscovering the blessing of God that is found as we mature as a disciple. For such a time as this, never in the history of our church do we have this many disciples who are trained and capable to replicate. So yes, we are a small church. We are in this corner of the city. But we're doing what we're doing because God has brought us back to his word. And when the word is at the center of our worship and everything that we are doing, when we apply the word of God, when the, we allow the word of God to convict us of our sin, this is where we experience power. This is where we experience blessing. This is where revival begins. Right? Verse 14. Because they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month. What did the Israelites do? They applied the word. They applied the word. They celebrated the feast to point themselves and to point one another back to God because God is doing something. Right? Verse 17, and the whole company, everyone that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them, right? They go out of their way to build these shelters. They bother to take the time to apply the word that they had neglected for over 140 years, right? That's why James 1.22 reminds us, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. No, do what it says. When God's people gain a renewed understanding of the word and apply it, they're filled. They're filled with joy and they celebrate. Because when you really think about it, there really is no greater joy in this life. There's no greater honor in our lives. No greater feeling than just to do one thing, just to obey God. And I don't know why we settle for so much less We'd rather have comfort than to obey. We'd rather be more convenient. We, we, we don't want to be inconvenienced instead of obey. And so, yes, applying the word, it takes work. Yes, applying the word takes sacrifice. 
And so, yeah, Tuesdays and Fridays, it's hard to get here. No, we sit in traffic and we say, God, I want to meet you. I want to encounter you through your word. Right? We go out of our way, even at UIC right now, to set up and to break down all of this equipment each and every week. But I do believe that this is our time. What does God have for us tomorrow? We don't know. Where will he take us next? In the city? Out of the city? I don't know. What we do know is that we have to do one thing. We have to proclaim the word. We have to be convicted by the word. We have to respond to what the word says. And so we're asking, why does the word of God help us reestablish worship? It's because the word of God is the foundation to revival, which leads us to the last question. How do we reestablish worship? First thing is this, by understanding the importance of the word. You know, a lot of things that I'm saying today is pretty obvious, um, but it's the word. I have to just teach what the word says. So understanding the importance of the word. And we see how the word is important to this community as they're trying to reestablish themselves and bring their worship to God. Because Israel had been away from the word. And when we get away from the word, what happens? We lose focus. But when the word is at the center of our worship, do you know what happens? We fear God. Look at verse 5. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Why did they stand up? They had reverence for the word. And then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, amen, amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. You're asking, why are they faces to the ground? They fear God. Right? It's the only appropriate response to God. Right? We stand when it's time to worship, when we hear his word. We get, our knee, get on our knees when it's time to pray. We put our face to the ground in reverence and in fear of him. Right? Those who fear God are blessed. Right? Psalm 112, verse 1. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Right? Those who fear God's promises find great satisfaction in his word. And you know what the fear of God does? It leads us to repentance. Like verse 9. For the, all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. I mean, when was the last time you mourned you wailed. You grieved over your sin, your willful disobedience against God. And again, this is the reason why a lot of times closing praise, if the message is on, we're, we're like awakened. Like God's spoken to me. I've been slapped across the face. Right. You know why? Because Hebrews 4.12, and I'm actually going to read King James Version, says this. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And the word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so when God is speaking to you, you better respond. Don't merely listen to the word and deceive yourself. Do what it says. Word helps discern the deceptive nature of our hearts, and we're called to repent. Because after years of ignoring and dismissing the word, Ezra finally proclaims it, and the people are convicted by it, and they realize, oh, you know what? Obedience actually is so much better than disobedience, because they're set free in a way that some had never experienced before in their generation. The wheels of revival, this unleashing of God's power and blessing were now in motion, and I think a lot of us know revival is not a one-time experience that happens at a retreat or praise night, just as I've learned the hard way. No, when we realize the importance of God's word, we run to God day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. That's when revival happens. It happens every moment we find ourselves in the word of God. So we're asking, how do we establish worship? By understanding the importance of the word. Second, by realizing the power of obedience. By realizing the power of obedience. Because until we wrestle with the word, we will not unleash the power of the word to obey. Nothing changes. We're like a hamster running on a wheel, running in place. We stay the same. You accomplish nothing. You build nothing. And so we go to the word, right? Verse 9. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Right? Like the Israelites, we have to find power in our repentance and turning 
back to God. Look at verse 12. Then all the people went away to eat and drink and send portions of food and to do what? To celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. They understood now how to obey, right? We find power by continually rejoicing and celebrating in the forgiveness of our sins, the ability that God has given us to come back to him, verse 16. And so, right, as the word is instructed, the people went out and they obeyed. They brought back branches, built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate and the one by the gate of Ephraim. Right? We find power when we continually respond and we obey what God's word says. For the word, once again, is finally at the center of their worship for the first time in a long time. Even the people, these people here in Israel, they were just, they were sick of their mediocrity. They were sick of their own compromise, of their willingness to accommodate, to intermarry with the enemy. They weren't observing the Sabbath, all of these feasts and offerings. They were leaving the temple unguarded. And because of that, they were so sick of it because they had no power and they didn't have the blessing of God. And yet the word of God is spoken and it humbled them, and God broke them, right? Word of God revives our hearts and our minds. And so we're asking, how do we establish, reestablish worship? We have to understand the importance of the word. We have to realize the power of obedience, and then one more, by experiencing the joy of obedience. Six times here in chapter 8, Nehemiah says that the people spent time in the word to what? To understand it. Right, verse 8 says this. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people what, understood what was being read. To understand means to discern, to grow in intelligence and in knowledge, to understand it. Why? Well, ultimately, to obey it. Because you only mature, you only grow when you obey the word. You accomplish nothing if you just puff up in knowledge. And you, they're like, oh, I'm so convicted by the word, but nothing about you changes. And then 16 times, did you know Nehemiah says that it was all the people? It was all the people came together to understand what the word of God said, right? These people were united in their study of the word. They were united in their conviction. They were united in their commitment to say, yes, God, we will obey you. And they experienced something that this generation and that their generation never experienced before. Verse 18. So day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. Again, Ezra read the law every day, five to six hours for seven days straight, and the people were eager. They were determined to obey the word. And when all the people were together, they're not asking, hey, when is this going to end? They're asking, God, how can we obey you? So we're asking, how do we reestablish worship? Three ways, by understanding the importance of the word, realizing the power of obedience, and by experiencing the joy of obedience. Psalm 1 Chapter 1, verse 1 says this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. But those who delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. And just as the psalmist prayed here, that's my prayer for our church. That we will be a church who is satisfied with just saying, Lord, I want to obey your word. I want to be part of a church and pray for a church that meditates on the word day and night. Again and again and again, right? Because this is where we find revival. This is where we find power. This is where we find our blessing. So that we will be a church who, when we gather for worship, is firmly anchored in the truth and the promises found in God's word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the power example of Nehemiah, of Ezra, and the Levites, and even of the people's dedication to reestablishing 
worship. And in our worship here, may we commit ourselves to the proclamation, to the conviction, and to the response of your word. You invite each and every one of us here to help build the walls, to build the church. And so I pray that we would not be a people that grieve the spirit of God, but help each and every one of us to contemplate and to wrestle with you so that your word would shape us, so that your word would transform us, so that we would keep you at the center of our church. We thank you, God, for showing us today that true worship, that true revival begins and ends with the word. So we thank you for this encouragement. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us continue our time of worship as we give our tithes and offerings to the Lord. You can give on the app, you can give through Zelle, or if you've brought a fiscal offering, you can leave it in the basket by the door after service. Let's now take this time to stand and sing in response to the message.
together. God, thank you for your word. We thank you that your word in our church takes center stage. And I pray that we would be a people that would stay close to your word, not just on Sundays when we come and worship, but each and every day. That we would be a a people committed to studying it, to being convicted by it, and responding to it, and obeying you. For we know that is where we find our greatest joy and our greatest satisfaction worshiping a God who is so good to his people. We thank you that you see us. We thank you that you remember us, God. And we do pray that you would go with us. Go with our church. Wherever you send us, we will go. We will follow. We will obey. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine down upon you. May he pour out his favor and peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, New Community Church. We are so glad that each and every one of you is able to make it here today. We'd love to get to know you if you're new if you're, or if you're visiting, so please stick around for fellowship after the announcements where we have refreshments in the back as well. If you're curious about the vision of our church and if you'd like to learn more about discipleship, then you can sign up for Discipleship 100 on the app or you can talk to Pastor Frank as well. There's actually going to be a meeting held this upcoming Tuesday on June 21st here at West Loop after prayer meeting, so you can come attend that if you'd like. For the month of July, we'd like, uh, we will be having both of our Sunday services at UIC. So please don't forget, mark your calendars, and you can see all the details on the app, or if you're a member, you should have gotten an email that gives the information as well. Uh, And here's a reminder that for uh, the upcoming Fridays this summer, CM and Youth Group, Children and youth will have an adjusted summer schedule. You can find out more on the app or contact Lois if you'd like to know more about that. Otherwise, we have our regularly scheduled prayer meetings here at West Loop on Tuesday and Friday from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. We hope to see you there, and we hope to see you next week as well. If you have any questions about any of the announcements, uh, feel free to ask any staff or check out the app. Thank you, and have a blessed week.